All right, good evening, folks. Um, my name is Paul Webster, and I'm the policy director for Clean and Healthy New York. Thanks so much for being here this evening for the first in a series that we're going to be doing this legislation, uh, this legislative session, uh, a bunch of webinars on environmental justice and policy issues here in New York State, and. Um, Tonight, we are going to hear from three of our statewide environmental leaders to discuss our coalitions uh, and the state budget, which uh, Governor Kathy Hochul uh, introduced today, and we're going to get people's impressions on that, and then talk about our legislative uh, priorities policies and what we're going to be working on this legislative session. Again, my name is Paul Webster uh, with Clean and Healthy New York. I am the policy director and we're going to hear from today uh, three of our leaders. Uh, the first we're going to hear from uh, tonight is Christina A. Dozier, who is the executive director of the Children's Defense Fund here in New York. Uh, the policy director of We Act for Environmental Justice, Sonal Jessel, who's also the co-leader of the Just Green Partnership, and uh, Bobby Wilding, the executive director uh, of Clean and Healthy New York here in Albany. And uh, to get some of the things that we're going to talk about is our coalitions, um, Clean and Healthy New York, and excuse me. Just Green Partnership and Lead Free Kids New York. Um, and uh, the Just Green Partnership uh, was founded in 2006 and uh, is a diverse coalition working on many environmental issues around uh, the state uh, to advance uh, toxic work in terms of eliminating toxics in our state. And uh, we uh, were very instrumental in getting uh, four environmental bills passed this year that we'll talk about uh, a little later, and also our Lead Free Kids Coalition, which was founded in 2009, and it's a coalition of about 35 or so environmental groups and working to eliminate uh, childhood lead poisoning and primary and secondary source lead contamination here in New York State. And to talk about uh, the issues here tonight, we're going to introduce and start uh, with um, Christina Dozier, the executive director of the Children's Defense Fund. Christina? So good evening, everyone. Um, as Paul stated, I am the executive director of Children's Defense Fund New York. Um, Children's Defense Fund New York is an organization uh, which advocates for, which serves the largest and most diverse generation in American history. Um, that includes 74 million um, children and youth who are under the age of 18 and 30 million young adults under the age of 25 with a specific focus on serving and advocating for those um, living in um, poverty and those living in communities of color. And so um, CDF New York specifically uh, works at the intersection of racial justice um, and you know issues of child advocacy. And so CDF New York um, has different um, issue focus areas. Um, one is health justice, a second is economic mobility, a third is education justice, a fourth is child welfare, and a fifth is um, youth justice. And so definitely honored to be a part of, to co-lead with We Act and Clean and Healthy New York, the Lead Free Kids um, New York campaign. And so what I'll say about, um, and I also want to shout out my dynamic, amazing health and economic mobility team, um, ben and Missy, who um, do such amazing work um, for um, children experiencing health issues and issues of poverty and who actually um, do, the, do the work um, of representing CDF New York in the Clean and um, um, the Lead Free Kids um, New York campaign. And so um, the lead issue is, you know, 
is a is a tremendous issue because of the impact that it has on our most vulnerable um, young people, our babies, and our children. Um, from a from a health perspective, exposure to lead can be really severe, um, and it can really have create permanent neurological damage to our young people unnecessarily. And so that's one of you know, the main issues um, that it is a crisis. I think if, you know, I haven't been blessed as of yet um, to be a mother, but I can only imagine, you know, having a daughter, a son, and um, them coming out, you know, healthy or whatnot, and then them being exposed to lead unnecessarily and having to deal with um, the financial costs and then also just the, the emotional toll um, that it takes um, on individuals who are already dealing with a lot. And so this is something that shouldn't exist um, in terms of um, health justice. And so we are committed to that work. What I'll also say is that, um, you know, New York is known for many great things in terms of being like a super, you know, progressive state a state that is, you know, focused on, you know, racial justice, racial equity. Um, but how can we actually say that we're that type of state when um, in New York, um, New York has more known cases of children with elevated blood lead levels than any other state in the nation. And so to me, um, this is a big stain on um, our nation, I mean, on our state. And it's something that we need to make sure that we rectify um, immediately. And not only that, when I think when people think about, you know, in modern times, right, when you think about, you know, childhood led and different things like that, people tend to think about what happened in Flint in terms of that water crisis. And, you know, that was um, just national outrage when that happened. But I don't know if people realize that um, in our state um, and in New York City, um, our young people are five, um, are dealing with five to six times higher lead levels. Than, um, than those children in Flint, Michigan at the peak of this water crisis. So that's just another example um, of an example of uh, why this is such a critical issue um, for our state. And so it shouldn't have happened in Flint and it should not be happening um, in New York City and in New York State. Um, and then also, if you look at um, Buffalo, for example, um, children from neighborhoods of color are 12 times as likely um, than children from predominantly white neighborhoods to test um, for elevated blood levels. And so um, this is, you know, a racial justice issue, a racial equity issue. Um, and so no child, no matter your economic, um, you know, just your economic state in terms of what your family is living with should have to deal with a preventable um, illness like lead. And so um, I'll also speak to as I've, I've already talked a little bit about um, some of the, the costs that families have to deal with when it comes to lead. And I've already stated that um, those who are disproportionately impacted are um, families, children who are um, low income, who are living in poverty. And so they just can't afford the cost, right? Of having to, you know, all of the, the hospital treatments that they have to, um, might have to endure um, the medical bills that come with, you know, treating um, this illness. Um, when you think about the neurological impact that this has on young people, there are academic costs to that in terms of um, like certain like services as it relates to like special education services um, that they might need. And then also just the, the emotional um, and financial toll on families in terms of parents, caretakers having to take time off um, from work in order to make sure, in order to take their child to like doctor's appointments and different things like that. And so this is just an unnecessary, um, um, this is just unnecessary for, you know, families and children to have the experience because, um, you know, lead is completely preventable. And so we need to make sure um, that we make the necessary investment so that no child, no family has to endure um, this preventable, uh, this preventable illness. And so, you might think, um, why is um, New York um, situated in a place where uh, we have the highest um, rates of like lead poisoning in the nation? And it actually has to do with um, our housing stock. And so New York has the oldest housing inventory among the 50 states. 
and the highest percentage of our pre-1960, pre-1950 housing, uh, which places our children at a particularly high risk of exposure to lead hazards. So that's why, um, and who tends to live in those like older, you know, housing development, it tends to be, um, you know, children who are poor, um, children um, who are um, children of color. And so not only are, you know, our children living in housing, um, that is that is making them sick. Um, we also know that, especially in like New York City, um, but also in other areas throughout the state, um, you know, housing costs are just, you know, just so high and are increasing. So even if your child is in a, your family and you're living in a, in a dwelling or in a house that's making your child sick, there's not a lot of options available to you to move to housing um, that isn't making your child sick. And so so that's an element um, that we have to that we have to think about um, as well. I've already talked about you know the fact that those who are disproportionately impacted or are children of color and poor children, and I fully believe um, that um, that that um, lead poisoning would not be an issue and we wouldn't have this crisis if um, if it wasn't um, impacting poor children, and so. It really says something about how we um, how we value our children and how we place different values on children who are poor versus children who aren't poor. Um, and so we need to um, make sure um, that you know those who are most most vulnerable and those who are most in need, um, governmental resources are um, being situated, you know, to help um, improve their like quality of life. And so I just wanted to to make that point. Um, another, you know, economic point that I will make is that um, childhood lead exposure among New York children born in 2019 is projected to cost our state an estimated 6.4 billion um, through, redu through reduced um, lifetime productivity, premature mor uh, mortality, and increased spending on healthcare utilization, education, and social assistance. So it is just not in the financial interest um, of our state and of our nation to allow, um, to, to allow this crisis to persist. And um, what I'll also say is that, um, is that, as I've said, I think a number of times already, is that this is something that is preventable. This is something that our children do not have to experience, um, do, um, do not have to, um, won't, don't have to like endure um, an illness like this. And so I believe, um, and our coalition believes, that is, it is the responsibility of the state to act um, to, to prevent and to end, um, you know, lead poisoning in New York State. And so, um, we are calling for um, the governor to make a bold investment um, in that regard. And so, you know, um, in terms of this moment in history that we're living in, right, like, you know, people people talk about like how we're in crisis, right? Like the pandemic is a crisis. Um, the economic recession is a crisis. Well, um, you know, lead poisoning in New York, I mean, uh, yeah, lead poisoning in New York is a crisis as well. And so we need to make sure that we have uh, we take bold actions in order to actually end it. And so we are um, asking that um, that the governor support a bold $1 billion investment um, in our public health infrastructure to end childhood lead poisoning. And so I don't know if you all want me to go into um, the four different areas um, that we want that $1 billion. Sure. What we're going to do, Christina, we can come back to that. We'll go to the next speaker and then we'll do that during the question and answer period. But thank you so much. And yes, folks, it is a bold ask by our coalition for $1 billion, but with the state's uh, fiscal position that uh, Bobby will talk about a little later, the state has the resources and the funding to be able to accomplish what Christina laid out. Our next speaker is going to be um, Sonal Jessel, who is the policy director of We Act for Environmental Justice in Harlem. And she is also our co-leader of the Just Green Partnership. Hi, Sonal. How are you tonight? Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Um, as Paul said, my name is Sonal Jessel. I'm the director of policy at We Act for Environmental Justice. 
We are a community-based organization based in Harlem, um, in West Harlem. And uh, for the past 30, coming on 34 years now, we act has been organizing for healthy communities, particularly fighting for environmental justice by pushing back against environmentally racist policies and programs that have led to a disproportionate impact of um, environmental health issues and hazardous exposures to communities um, of color and low income. We started just by focusing in Harlem, Washington Heights and Inwood, and that is where we engage in community organizing and direct outreach to members of the public. However, we do policy work uh, citywide, statewide, and we also have an office in DC and do federal policy work as well as a prominent voice in the national environmental justice movement. And uh, we work heavily <laughs> with Clean and Healthy New York and um, CDF and all these other great groups working on environmental health because we fundamentally believe that health is a human right that everyone deserves to live in a healthy environment where they can um, live, play, pray, and learn, um, and that there is a disproportionate impact of hazards that hurt certain communities more. Um, as we just heard, childhood lead poisoning is a big one. It is very much baked in mechanisms of systematic and institutional and interpersonal racism. Um, there's uh, some other great policies that we work on uh, through the Just Green Partnership, which is the coalition that we co-lead as Paul mentioned. And in the Just Green Partnership, we really focus a lot on uh, toxic chemicals, which is something I'll talk about. And uh, just generally, how do we ensure that we are um, promoting a safe environment for people? So I am just going to go over a couple of the things that we're focusing on this year with the Just Green Partnership. And what we're doing is essentially advocating to the state to enact different legislative changes that we wanna see that are addressing some of the core um, environmental health issues that we see um, is facing the communities we represent today. So thank you, Paul, for sharing. The first one is the Safer Cosmetics and Personal Care Act. Uh, this legislation is really important because it's addressing the idea that there are a lot of toxic chemicals in our cosmetics and our products that we use on our bodies and our hair every single day, whether that be our shampoos or our soaps or our makeup. Um, there's a lot of toxic chemicals in there. And those chemicals, once you take a lot in, and particularly people see the impact when you have a cumulative exposure to chemicals, meaning you're getting these chemicals taken in through your cosmetics, but also through your food and through your water and through all these other sources, that there are lasting long-term negative health impacts, um, such as uh, cancers. So a lot of these chemicals are endocrine disruptors. They hurt your reproductive health system. Um, they work, they hurt your nervous system and they impact your respiratory system. They might be asthmogens. Um, so there's a lot of research, thousands and thousands and thousands of research studies that have connected how a lot of toxic chemicals that we take in every day through our everyday products really hurts our health. So the Safe Cosmetics and Personal Care Act is really important because it is banning some of the um, toxic chemicals that we consider to be um, really some of the some of the biggest presence in cosmetics and the most harmful to health. And so what this bill is doing is it's, it's requiring the state to, or sorry, it's requiring companies that sell these products and manufacture these products like our soaps and our shampoos to disclose what is in their um, products in a way that they currently do not do and then to also eventually be restricting the use of certain products in, um, sorry, restricting the use of certain chemicals in these products and not even allowing them to be sell, sold or distributed in the state. So some of those toxic chemicals are lead, as we've already talked about, it is, there's mercury, formaldehyde, toluene, PFAS, which is a class of chemicals that are really bad for your health and a lot of other things. 
The second bill that we have here is the cumulative impacts bill. That's what we call it. Um, this bill is really addressing a um, legacy environmental justice issue and an issue that um, really helped kickstart and motivate an environmental justice movement in the United States. And this is the idea that particularly communities of color have all these environmentally hazardous facilities sited in their communities, one on top of another. So you have your sewage treatment plan in the same community that you have all the bus depots and the power plants and all of these toxic facilities. And what this bill is doing is saying that you can't do that anymore. <laughs> that um, if, if a um, entity wants to put a facility in a neighborhood in New York State, they have to prove that they're not contributing to an existing public health issue, whether that be making air pollution worse than it already is in a community. And if they are existed, contributing to this, then they can't get their permit approved to site in that neighborhood. The next one is the clearing the toxic air. This is also an environmental justice related issue, particularly, um, I mean, all of them really are, but this one specifically is where it's saying that you can actually not, it's, it's putting a limit on the emissions of certain air contaminants and making sure that the limits um, of what's allowed to be in our air with these contaminants is actually enforced and that, um, the emitter gets fined if they are going over this certain amount. And the fines actually will go to a fund that's supposed to help clean up communities that are disproportionately impacted by um, poor air quality. The next one is the Birds and the Bees Protection Act. Um, this one is essentially saying that neonicotinoids, which is a uh, class of chemicals that's been proven to have negative health impacts on animals and on babies. Um, and there's not enough research done, but we're very sure that there is also likely a huge impact on adults and through their lifespan as well, um, that it's banning the use of this pesticide because it's been found to have all these negative health impacts, both for wildlife and for humans. And it's um, requiring the state to really look into what acceptable alternatives there is to using the neonicotinoid pesticides. It's called the Birds and the Bees Protection Act because it is um, addressing the fact that wildlife is harmed by the use of these pesticides but we don't feel like that name fully gets at the idea that there is a really big human health impact to um, the people who use the pesticides, so people who are spraying plants and seeds, and also the people who are exposed down the line. The next one is PFAS and apparel. Um, PFAS is a class of chemicals that is really bad for your health. They hurt your endocrine system. Um, and essentially what this is saying is that you can't have it in apparel, like your clothing. And um, after a certain number of years, it bans it. And um, it's requiring more disclosure of, of those chemicals. The last one that I'll touch on is packaging EPR. EPR stands for um, Extended Producer Responsibility Act. And basically, I find this really complicated, but essentially it's a new recycling mechanism for um, ensuring that uh, items actually get recycled. And it's particularly putting the onus on the people who reduce the pack, who produce the packaging to also recycle the packaging. Um, it is a, a process that has been adopted in other countries like Germany, um, it hasn't yet been adopted in the United States, so New York would, I believe, be one of the first states to do so. And um, I will stop there. Well, I guess the last one is the development of the PFAS ban legislation, and that's the idea that um, PFAS being one of the most toxic persistent chemicals in our environment, it actually is our waterways are full of PFAS um, contaminants. I'm sure everyone has heard about the, um, or maybe heard about the different instances where a chemical manufacturing um, industry has polluted the water with a bunch of nasty chemicals, oftentimes that ends up being PFAS. Um, PFAS is also known to be Teflon, if you've heard of anything nonstick, that's all PFAS chemicals. And um, we just think that it's difficult to ban a chemical by 
the different classes of where it could be found. So banning it in our shampoos and then banning it in our clothing. Um, we think there needs to be a bolder, bigger action to stop this chemical from contaminating our bodies and our waterways um, in a bigger way. So that's something that we're also working on. I will stop there to not take more time, but I'm sure I can answer questions later. All right. Thank you so much, Sonal. And uh, thanks everyone for being here with us this evening. Uh, this is our 2022 environmental uh, health and environmental justice policy uh, priorities here in New York State. My name is Paul Webster, um, the policy director of Clean and Healthy New York. And we've heard from this evening uh, from Kersina Dozier, who is the executive director of the Children's Defense Fund in New York and uh, one of the leaders in our Lead Free Kids New York Coalition. And we just heard from uh, Sonal Jessel, uh, the policy director of WE Act for Environmental Justice in Harlem. And she's also the co-leader of New York's Just Green Partnership. And now we'll hear from the executive director of Clean and Healthy New York, Bobby Wilding, who'll talk about um, how we're tying all of this together and just to give some uh, outlook on the state budget. Hi, Bobby. Hey, Paul, thank you so much. And thank you, Christina and Sonal for uh, all that you've done and, and for your partnership. Um, Clean and Healthy New York often uh, closes our emails with the words together we win. And uh, really that is at the core of what we do um, is, is work through collaboration. Our mission statement is to build a just and healthy society in which toxic chemicals are simply unthinkable. And when we look at all of the words in there, we recognize that that means that toxic chemicals have to be unthinkable, both in the places that they currently exist and in what we produce going forward. Um, and so we are um, focused, as you've heard, on addressing for good the, the lead, legacy of lead poisoning in New York, which comes primarily from uh, lead in uh, house paint. So uh, in addition to calling for a billion dollars in the budget, some of which was included, uh, including some support for the Department of Health in the governor's budget that launched was dropped today, uh, the, we also are looking at addressing cumulative impacts. Uh, as Sonal talked about, to address the legacy of problems that are both uh, systemically problematic when it comes to the, our environment and also systemically problematic when it comes to race. Um, we are focused on changing laws, shifting markets and empowering people so that we can advance innovative solutions and have a sustainable economy. Um, and so what we're seeing in the governor's budget today is uh, an expansion of the Environmental Protection Fund. It uh, is moving, increasing up to four and $400 million in capital investments and programs, including uh, programs that we deeply support like the Children's Environmental Health Centers, which are a chain of uh, hospitals across New York State with building up pediatric expertise on um, environmental health so that pediatricians can help identify where environmental health concerns are coming in for the children that they care for. Uh, it includes uh, funding for the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute based out at RIT, which helps companies go well beyond regulation and make significant steps toward uh, reducing waste, uh, addressing toxics, advancing safer products um, and materials and the uh, relatively new uh, Center for Sustainable Materials Management at SUNY ESF. And I'm just gonna give a shout out to Kate Walker, who's the director there. She joined us tonight. Um, so the EPF includes that and a whole lot more. There's a new investment in uh, water infrastructure and expanded inf investment in that, that is moving to half a billion dollars. And that's gonna include addressing some of the um, lead pipe concerns that we have because we also have a legacy of, of ancient pipes that are many of which are um, made with lead. Uh, there's an increase in the bond act that we're all going to see on the uh, November ballot, which is a $4 billion investment in our uh, green infrastructure and um, a number of other uh, investments in the environment, 
Also included in the budget language from the governor today is um, her own take on extended producer responsibility uh, that Sonal raised. So what we're, we haven't even, it's like hot off the presses. We haven't even been able to read it before we got to talk to you guys tonight. Um, it also includes uh, an increase in funding for staff at the Department of Environmental Conservation, which is something that as an environmental movement, we recognize is long overdue. In the past, when we've gone through recessions, we've had, uh, though each state agency has been slashed. And what we've seen is that over time, the Department of Environmental Conservation has not been restored to its previous levels, even as our economy recovers. And what that really means is that um, the programs that we've been really successful at winning. So in 2021 alone, we got a ban on little mini bottles being used for personal care products at hotels. They can dispense them through refillable dispensers. We got a uh, restrictions on coal tar in asphalt. Um, we got uh, a uh, expansion of uh, the contaminants that the state has to look at in our, in our water supply, including new PFAS chemicals. Uh, 40 new chemicals were added to that list and there's a new process to actually move chemicals through that evaluation process and into being um, uh, part of the regular system where they have maximum contaminant levels. This, these are all huge. And on top of that, on New Year's Eve, the, the governor gave us a year-end present of the uh, Family and Firefighter Protection Act, which bans broad swaths of chemicals used as flame retardants in furniture, bedding, and for the first time in the United States, electronic devices, uh, like cases like your laptop's uh, case or your TV screens. Um, these are all critical wins. We need staff at the state agencies in order to implement them. And one of the things that we hear over and over again from each agency that we talk to, whether it's housing talking about lead paint or it's uh, the Department of Health talking about the, the fact that we have a lot of children that need help because they've already been lead poisoned or the DEC where they're responsible for implementing these bills I was just talking about, um, we need staff. And so uh, we'll be looking closely at how much of an increase is being brought to the DEC um, and making sure that there are adequate resources to being distributed to actually implement the, the bills that we are advocating for. So we're really excited about what is coming for 2022. We've got a great budget season. It's gonna be a short year. Usually the New York State Legislature um, ha meets from the beginning of January till almost the end of June. And the first half of the year through April 1st is the part where we focus on the budget. And the second half, it, almost, it was almost evenly split is where we really dig into those substantive policy discussions. And this year um, we end up with about a six week window after session, uh, after the budget is all done and there's time off to recognize important holidays in the middle of uh, April. We're gonna have about six weeks to advance our program bills. So we're gonna be working on those all session as well as advocating for the uh, policy and the budget uh, improvements. But uh, we're really excited about uh, our champions in both houses and uh, the staff at the governor's office and the governor herself in terms of what she's already marking out. Um, and we'll be counting on all of you to help us um, make the impact we wanna make. Um, and so we've got a couple of advocacy days coming up, but we can like dig into that in maybe a more informal format if uh, Paul and our other presenters wanna join us. And then we can get into some Q&A from the audience. If you've got questions, I'm just gonna take Paul's line and say, if you've got questions you wanna ask, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And sure, and thanks, Bobby. Um, as, as we talk uh, now uh, with our presenters, I, uh, I do recall, uh, Christina, you wanted to describe four of the priorities for uh, the Lead Free Kids New York. Uh, could you tell us what they are? Sure, I'll be very brief. Um, as I said to um, Bobby Paul um, tonight, I can I can just keep going. So please cut me off. Um, so I'm glad that he did. Um, but um, as I stated before, uh, we are asking for uh, one billion dollars in order for the state to address um, our childhood lead crisis, and we feel like. Um, that is a small um, cost to pay when you think about what the true cost is for this um, crisis continuing. And so we're asking for 300 million for the Department of Health to bolster um, local departments um, 
in terms of like executing their functions. And so currently our local um, health departments don't have enough staff um, in order to um, alert families to the fact that, you know, um, their children are harmed by, you know, the housing that they're in. And so making sure that there's enough local health department staff to actually help um, families. Um, secondly, 100 million for the lead environmental threat elimination training program, which will create um, a workforce development fund to identify lead contamination in homes and buildings and mitigation services, uh, 500 million for um, the lead repair slash renovation program, and 100 million um, for the lead environmental hazard program. And cannot, you know, stress enough the fact that if, you know, um, the reason why um, we are disproportionately impacted is because of our housing stock then um, the state solution should deal with helping us to solve uh, to solve the issue as it relates to that. And so, um, it, you know, a billion dollars sound like a lot, but again, as I said, it's, just, it's, it's not a lot when you think about, um, you know, our children and, and what their worth is and what their value is, you know, to their individual families, to their communities and to our state. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. I see that there was a question from you um, from Sue Chase. Sue, would you like to ask a question now? Sue, you're on mute. Or you can drop your question in the chat. I did not have a question. Um, Sonal, you had um, mentioned about the uh, personal care uh, in cosmetics uh, bill that we're working on. Why is that an environmental justice issue? And why is that so critical? Um, as we've talked earlier about um, the impact on communities, especially women of color. Thanks, Paul. Yes, yeah, so um, this is a major environmental justice issue in that it is more so people of color, particularly young women of color that use the most cosmetics and personal care products, um, particularly using some ones that are known to be full of some really nasty chemicals. Um, in communities, we have the skin lightening cream, that's a big one, um, that is full of mercury, for example. Um, and then hair relaxers are another big one that are full of, I don't remember which chemicals, but very bad ones. Um, and one reason why this is, or one of the core reasons why this is an environmental justice issue is because the reasons why young women of color are using these products more is because of these white beauty standards that pressure young women of color to look a certain way or to feel um, like they're not beautiful in the, the skin and the hair that they're in, um, the uh, colorism and anti-blackness that is pervasive in the United States and across the world that leads to this type of um, use of really harmful ingredients. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I know the studies have found that um, young women are using I think somewhere around three times as more products per day as any other group of people. Um, and that is also compared to young men of color too. So this is um, an issue for environmental justice is an issue that is very much intersecting um, sex and race and gender and race when it comes to um, why this is, this is a major issue. And then I'll also add another reason why this is an environmental justice issue is because um, like I, I sort of stated is that these toxic chemicals are not coming from just one source. And the reason why it hurts your health is because it's coming from a lot of different sources and cumulatively building up in your body. So it's also communities of color that are exposed to other sources of these toxic chemicals like food and food packaging from processed foods, like water contamination, for example. Um, there was um, recently a settlement against Johnson & Johnson for their baby powder that was actually proven, they proved in this lawsuit that, that the Johnson & Johnson was particularly targeting 
black communities to sell their product that they knew caused cancer. Um, so these things are happening over and over and over again on top of each other and leading to really negative health impacts. So that's um, why we consider this an environmental justice issue. Okay, thanks so much, Sonal, for that answer. Um, I see we have a question in the chat from Angela and it says, thanks for all the information. Uh, what are we doing to push forward our campaigns? Bobby, you wanna tackle that question? Yeah, so there's a lot of ways that people, whether they're representing an organization or uh, individually to, to get involved. So our campaigns are both uh, sort of inside campaigns. Uh, right now, the, the legislature has closed the legislative office building, so we're not having in-person meetings and the way that New York functions. Um, unlike other states, there are not as many public hearings and opportunities for everyone's perspective to be heard out loud in front of everybody else. Um, so we uh, we organize advocacy days and we've got um, an advocacy day coming up on February 16th for the Just Green Partnership and on March 15th for the Lead Free Kids New York coalitions. Those are where we, we want members of the public to come. Um, we want anyone, you know, everyone to be there and making their voice heard. Um, some of the folks who are on the Zoom tonight have come to advocacy days in the past. And if you have, you quickly realize that even if you walk in at the beginning of the day feeling like you don't know much, by the time you've gone through a couple of meetings, you realize that you know more than the person that you're talking to about the issue you're talking about. And particularly if it's something that directly affects you, you are an expert about your own experience. Um, and so all of that is really powerful. Um, and so people can participate in these advocacy days by Zoom. So you don't have to travel. It's one of the advantages of COVID is that we now can engage people without them having to devote all of those extra hours of travel from wherever they might be all the way up to Albany. Um, unless you happen to live in Albany, which few of us do. Um, and then the other way is like for organizations, you can actually write what are called memos of support if your organization can do that. Um, and we distribute them to the people that need to hear about from supporters. I will say that one of the things that I think that makes what our work so powerful is that because it crosses a lot of lines and, and uh, impact, we, we identify the impact to different constituencies, we're able to bring together people that you might not expect to be in the same room supporting the issues. So with the Family and Firefighter Protection Act, for example, last year, firefighters were standing in support of banning flame retardants, which sounds like an oxymoron until you realize they're so toxic that when they do burn and they burn, they make the smoke more dangerous, both for people who are trying to escape, so harder for firefighters to rescue people, but also firefighters are dying of cancer um, because of the toxic smoke that they're exposed to. Um, and so they recognize the connection between toxic chemicals in all of our products, in our homes, and their health. Um, but it's not a connection you would necessarily see from the surface. So we're always looking for interesting and unique ways to pull together different voices because we think that is that is shown time and time again to be a powerful uh, mechanism for moving things in the in the capital. And then I would ha be happy also, Angela, to talk with you more about your particular uh, you know, niche and, and how you could be engaged. All right. Thank you so much for that, uh, Bobby. Um, in closing, any more questions from our audience? Dan, that's a, a long statement you have there. You might, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question or make the comment? Sure. I just the, the first part is just gushing a little bit. So about all the wonderful work y'all have been doing. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And congratulations on the victories in 2021. I just, you know, I'm, I, I think with all of the hopefully investments in green infrastructure that are coming up, that it will likely create a lot of new jobs. And I'm just I'm sort of just wondering, are there inclusions in the policies to make sure that these sort of green new these green jobs are equitably accessible to all workers? And um, uh, and and most importantly, safe jobs. Um, and then, like maybe that question in a simpler way is like, what kind of crossover do y'all see between environmental justice and occupational safety and health? Thank you. 
Thanks. So, Noel, do you have a response you want to jump in with? Yeah, um, I can start with a couple of things. One um, is around extreme heat. That's something at least we have has been working really heavily on is um, how the rising issue of extreme heat <laughs> particularly is a problem that cross cuts all sorts of industries. It hurts people at home, it hurts people um, working in jobs. And um, one thing we're really interested to see is better work safety practices when it comes to who's doing what on a really hot day. Um, and that there should be regulations around what, what people what employers are allowed to force their employees to do. Um, even this summer I was moving and uh, the movers, this, it, it, was, it was an extreme heat day and it was their third move of the day. And I just found that that was absolutely should have been some sort of violation of some type of health and safety practice because it's absolutely dangerous. People get really, really hurt in the heat. Um, so that's one thing, and I believe there is actually an existing bill um, that has not passed yet that is around um, requiring employers to have extreme heat plans and enforce them. Um, it's not something JGP or Just Green is particularly working on right now, but it's, it's a really important issue that we act works on. Um, and then green jobs, I think people often talk about the just transition and clean energy work. Um, in wind and solar and energy efficiency work and weatherization and all the work that's coming with getting off of fossil fuels. That's something that we work really heavily on is how to make sure that the communities we represent and work with are not left behind in that process. Um, you know, we know the solar industry, for example, is mostly white and white owned and that people of color that um, work in the industry are often entry level workers or part time workers or contract workers. Um, so they're not always these long-standing jobs that are building um, long-term wealth. And so we're really interested in how to make those jobs more accessible. So we do a lot of work promoting worker training programs. Particularly, we push the idea of creating worker cooperatives to promote ownership of businesses in the green jobs industries. Um, and uh, we do a lot of just community outreach work on jobs and really making sure that the state is um, held to standards of their employing um, who is being employed in these industries. Um, so we work really heavily to promote the idea that hiring has to be a certain number of people from what are considered the more disadvantaged communities um, and ensuring that there's more MWBE contracting being done, all of that work. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of spaces um, that cross over with occupational health and safety and environmental justice, definitely. Um, and those are just, those are just a couple. Thanks, Sonal, for, for that answer. I was going to uh, say that, uh, Christina, in the $1 billion ask from Lead Free Kids New York, is there any monies in there for worker training or uh, working with uh, any of are agencies that are doing any kind of workforce development? Yes, there's um, a 100 million for the lead environmental threat elimination training program, which would create a workforce um, development fund to identify lead contamination in homes, buildings, um, and to help in mitigating services. So that's 100 million in there. And then I also know that 300 million is to um, hire additional staff in our local departments, um, local health departments um, to track and refer um, children for services in a timely manner who are, are exposed to lead. So those are a couple of things. Yeah, and I think that we also do so have to, to look at the um, all of the money that's flowing right now, all of the infrastructure money coming from the federal government. I think that, you know, uh, it's easy for um, the systems of hierarchy that already exist to get perpetuated in those situations like Sonal was talking about with the renewable energy economy, um, mostly going to um, white people getting those jobs, right? And being a white owned industry. And I think that this is uh, an important moment and, uh, 
as advocates, we're going to need to figure out where, you know, as we work with folks across the state, you know, where are we paying attention in our local communities to ensure that the local projects include those provisions, like Sonal was talking about, for hiring a certain percentage of the community for projects that are happening near their near them. So it's not just bringing in workers from outside. Uh, I think that this is a critical component to how we shift towards being both just and non-toxic, right? That's how we, we make this move is by being intentional about um, where the money flows to. Thank you. And I see there's a question in the chat from Ginger for uh, Christina. And uh, the question is, it sounds like we need more than a billion dollars to fight uh, lead poisoning. Yes, we do, Ginger. Uh, let's see. How are we talking about lead remediation and have we asked for enough? Uh, <laughs> uh, I love that question, Ginger, thank you. Um, I don't uh, think the 1 billion includes money for, um, for victims, but I, I definitely um, think that I really acknowledge um, you asking that question um, and stuff like that. And so, but there is 500 million for lead repair, uh, for a lead repair and renovation program. Um, so I know that that is, um, that's um, available. And so I definitely agree um, that we're looking at 1 billion as a start um, to make, you know, substantial change. So thank you for those questions. <laughs> I would just add also that we do have, we are looking at policy that would um, drive this, uh, the work to do remediation in, in all homes before 1978. Um, and so that that is something that, um, you know, the state setting out those frameworks and then also having the financial investment in, in how people get trained to do those jobs is going to be um, a critical partnership. It's both the budget and then also what we're talking with the legislature about advancing. Um, and I think we've got some partners in the legislature that have shown their interest in, in making sure this work gets done. Um, and I see Tom is talking about the South End and the Port of Albany, um, where there's been announcements in recent days about uh, investments in wind, offshore wind energy. And it's exactly it. Um, that's exactly the kind of uh, situation that we have to look at critically for where the jobs are getting allocated and how the community is being protected from cumulative impacts. All right. And it seems that there's a, Martin, is that a, is that a question or are you making a statement? The floor is yours. I was responding to Dan's question whether there was a connection between um, uh, the situation of, well, between green chemistry and uh, uh, and uh, occupational health. And the point I was trying to make is the connection is brown chemistry currently not only poisons the communities where the factories are situated, but also the workers who are drawn from those communities. Um, and so it is both an occupational safety as well as an environmental justice issue. Yeah. A amen to that. Um, do we have any more questions uh, from our audience and, and folks gathered today? Um, any final thoughts from our uh, presenters? about what we could uh, look forward to this coming session. Paul, can you pop up on the screen the um, info about our upcoming events and ways people can get involved? Sure. Because that's really what we're hoping for is that we've inspired you to wanna come to an advocacy day. You could also write a letter to your local paper about these issues. Uh, you could make a phone call to your local legislator. There are a lot of really easy actions that uh, all contribute to um, actually getting these bills across the finish line. And particularly if you can think of a constituency like your church group or a uh, book group, I mean, any kind of constituency you might have that can weigh in. Um, those are sort of maybe the book group is a little silly. Sorry, it's been a long day, but uh, 
you know, community organizations of any kind, um, you know, spread the word to your friends. Uh, and uh, those, you know, there's all lots of easy ways to help make a big difference. So we've got uh, the um, Lead Free Kids Advocacy Day coming up on March 15th. We've got the um, Just Free Green Advocacy Day coming up on February 16th. And we're gonna be doing another gigantic uh, environment environmental community from land preservation through uh, toxics and environmental justice factors all over the place. Um, Earth Day Advocacy Day on uh, April 29th. So it's another chance to uh, come to the uh, April, I think it's the 20, no, it's the 26th. I'm somehow flipping that number in my head. Sorry about that. It's the Tuesday after Earth Day. Um, that's also likely to be virtual, but we're going to play it by ear. We'll see whether or not, you know, things shift before then. Um, but yeah, there's lots of ways to participate and uh, we will send you a follow-up email that's got some links so that you can get engaged. And with that, we just want to thank everyone for participating uh, today in our webinar on our environmental health and environmental justice priorities and issues here in New York State. Um, we're Clean and Healthy New York. We're going to be doing these one hour events each month uh, on a regular basis during this legislative session to keep people informed. We definitely wanted to be out there with our allies of the Children's Defense Fund and WE Act and the Just Green Partnership and Lead Free Kids New York today. Uh, as the governor released her executive budget plan for fiscal year 2022-2023, and we wanted our friends and allies to know that we're on top of it and we're gonna continue the efforts to make uh, some environmental impacts uh, in the justice and health of all New Yorkers by cleaning our air cleaning our water and making our society toxic free to the extent possible as we keep pushing this agenda to have a clean and healthy New York. We wanna thank everybody uh, for participating. Thanks to Sonal of WE Act and Christina of uh, the Children's Defense Fund and Bobby of uh, Clean and Healthy New York. We wanna Say to everyone, have a great night and we will be talking to you all soon. We'll see you on social media and Zoom. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.